Um, so now it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Kulkarni. Um, Jayashree uh, Kulkarni commenced her appointment as Professor of Psychiatry at the Alfred and Monash in 2002. She founded and directs this centre, the Monash Alfred Psychiatry Research Centre in Melbourne, Australia, which is a centre made up of a large group of uh, researchers and clinicians who are dedicated to developing new and novel treatments, understandings and clinical services for people with a range of mental illnesses. Um, Jayshree Kulkarni graduated in medicine, uh, from medicine um, medical school from Monash in 1981 and became a fellow of the College of Psychiatrists in 1989. She has conducted groundbreaking research since that time and is internationally renowned and acknowledged as a leader in the field of women's mental health and in particular for her innovative work looking at the relationship between reproductive hormones and mental health. Uh, in addition to numerous accolades that she has received over the years, um, Jay Shuri received uh, a member of the Order of Australia uh, in 2019. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Kulkarni to talk about women and COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. So Dr. Sarah Rothstein is a, an advanced trainee in psychiatry and an absolute whiz in education. And she has virtually single-handedly put together short courses and online teaching for our medical students in psychiatry. Sara is a wonderful colleague and good friend, and I'm so pleased to have her as one of the senior researchers in the Monash Alfred Psychiatry Research Centre. And thank you so much, Sara, for all your hard work. Thank and you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for making the time uh, at a precious time and lunch uh, hour um, to attend this particular webinar. It is on a topic that uh, I'm going to have a broader take on, which is women and COVID, and then focus on women's mental health and then uh, lead into women's mental health more generally. So um, I would like to begin by tackling some of the controversies, which is in definitions. So usually in the past, when we talked about women's mental health, there was absolutely no concern. But now we are very importantly recognise that definitions are critical in this particular area. So um, I would like to, first of all, define um, such things as sex belonging to biological differences, predominantly between males and females, with a chromosomal difference, female XX, male XY, and 95% of the population have this particular uh, clear sex chromosome de uh, definition. However, that's biological sex, and that's quite different to gender. So in the past, uh, gender was defined by cultural differences and expectations according to roles. And that was determined by society and culture uh, of people according to their sex. The old definition, very simplistic, was that the socially constructed roles and behaviours uh, that society typically associated were with two genders, male and female. So if we have a think about what's going on today, we note that there are many new definitions, and this is from um, the ABC, that in their current uh, reporting of current affairs and news, that they have 58 definitions of gender, and in fact that's actually gone up to 63 just recently as well. So again, what we're seeing here is a, a diverse descriptor or inclusivity for the term gender. Now, I'm not about to get into the gender debate because we know how difficult this debate can be and poor old JK Rowling found herself in the middle of a controversy that I'm sure wasn't um, intended. But nonetheless, I think it's important to declare that in this talk, I will be referring to biological sex, that's male, female, where appropriate, and I'll also be talking about gender, but in that definition, I want to be broad and inclusive when we talk about gender roles. So let's turn to look at COVID. So very interestingly, we find that in fact COVID um, in countries where there is actually a, uh, a female leader are equated with having lower COVID death rates. And so you can see here some of the famous um, leaders across the country. And down in the, in the box here, we have uh, the number of COVID deaths. 
and certainly um, you'll be aware of, of this particular correlation that has um, been described by many magazines and journals, but particularly Forbes magazine and has, has done several articles now correlating female leadership and lower COVID death rates in countries. And of course, we have Australia and apologies to Scott Morrison, but um, I figured that with Australian rates of COVID being quite low and that we're the envy of the world, that um, he clearly must be the female leader that we're looking for here. And in contrast, in the USA, we have um, unfortunately uh, statements coming out from the president of the USA about such things as taking um, bleach, drinking bleach or injecting bleach in order to um, combat the virus. And um, the United States is really in, in terrible situation with a rising death toll and rising numbers of coronavirus cases. So um, in more serious tone, looking at women and economic impacts, because why am I going to this, this length when we're really going to focus on women's mental health? Because it is critical to understand the mental health of women uh, in terms of a global, psychosocial and uh, other impacts that actually determine or have an impact on mental health and economy, economic impacts are one of those. So across the globe, women do still unfortunately earn less, save less, hold less secure jobs and are more likely to be casual employees. And that holds true in Australia as well as around the world. There is less access for women to social protections. And in the majority of single parent households, the economic uh, imperative to bring in a salary is on women as the majority of single parents. And unfortunately, all of this means that women's capacity to absorb economic shocks is less than that of men. Um, here, looking at pre-COVID female employment and housework in Australia, again, these issues impact importantly on, on mental health. Um, the HILDA study, which is the Household Income and Labour Dynamics in Australia, a very important study and a very well done study, shows that in fact, um, the dual income couples have risen significantly since 2001 with women being more educated uh, overall having higher degrees um, than men but earning less and it's an interesting point that when women are the chief provider in a family they actually still earn a lower income than men in fact seventy three thousand dollars nine hundred and eighty eight on average per year is the female income chief provider rate as compared to $107,366 for men. And also that women are still likely to work um, less than full time. Men um, overall performed an average of five hours less housework and eight hours less childcare, even in households where women are the primary earner. This means that there are still issues for female breadwinners in households trying to balance um, the unpaid weekly work and female breadwinners in households with children did the most unpaid weekly work of any group. It's a 43.4 hours, whereas male breadwinners in comparison did 26.2 hours. So you can see there that there's a considerable pre-COVID burden um, of housework, unpaid work on females, and that even when they have a single breadwinner, there's still not the equality in salary. So this is the economic situation that women walked into uh, with then COVID. So what has happened since then? So, and we're not through COVID yet. So this is still emerging data from the very early origins of COVID uh, impacting globally, that the Data projects that the COVID-19 global recession will result in a prolonged dip in women's incomes and labour force protection. Um, there are some interesting data that come out, and I haven't put it on the slide, from the GFC, you remember the global financial crisis, and in Australia data that goes back to 2007 uh, looks at the impact of, uh, of the financial recession depression, and the impact was particularly pronounced on men and women in the midlife range. So that's the group, not youth, but the midlife women and men. And in particular, 
while the suicide rates went up for both groups, it was higher in men who were unemployed and employed, but it was particularly uh, noticeable that women who were employed did better than women who were unemployed. This is the GFC data. So that's an extrapolative data base that we can look at what might happen for COVID-19 and is happening as we proceed through this pandemic, that women's incomes and labour force participation is already dipping, particularly in industries where there is a greater casual workforce. The first round of layoffs has been particularly acute in the services sector, including retail, hospitality and tourism, where women are overrepresented. And there is an expected rise globally in the number of women who are um, going to be living in poverty. And let's not forget that money is power. And so gains in power for women in pre-COVID time are expected to regress backwards uh, with decreased salaries, with decreased money for women. And that is a, a, a real pointer towards increased female vulnerability in the very near future. And this is all data and, and uh, based on the UN policy brief looking at the impact of COVID-19 on women in 2020. There are solutions, of course, and um, it is critical to think about the solutions as we go on rather than just list a gloom, doom, despair kind of picture, because such things as retaining a free universal childcare system, the JobKeeper supplement, providing immediate financial support for female and male international students and other women on temporary visas who cannot access income support or Medicare, looking at the essential services provided by those working in the feminised work quarters, such as the health sector, social assistance and education sectors um, are really critical. And also that constant battle to increase pay equity. It's really critical that all of us can address gender norms and practices that harm the women, that generally harm women's mental health. Health Again, women's mental health is subject to environmental or psychosocial stressors. The gender rigid stereotypes that really underpin the division of household labour are critical to tackle because that does create an increased stress. There's discussion about the mental load um, that, that women experience. This is not just the actual hours spent cleaning and washing and, and getting kids stuff organised, but it's all that mental pressure about thinking about that, having a, a mental load and thinking about, oh gosh, gosh, I have to organise the dinner, I've got to organise the housework, I've got to organise supervision of pickups and I've even got to think about it. So it's not just the contribution of actually doing the household task, it's the contribution in alleviating and taking a role in, in joining together to decrease that mental load or stress for women. Um, okay, so um, having moved from that situation, I'd like to talk a bit about women health and COVID. So this is physical health that I'm talking about. Women make up globally 70% of the health workforce and are much more likely to be frontline health workers. And we've seen through the pandemic, you know, we're very fortunate in Australia that our public health systems are so magnificent, that we've coped so well and that the measures in place have meant that the uh, numbers of people with COVID that we're dealing with are very much less. But globally, um, we've seen that in fact, frontline health workers, nurses, midwives, community workers are much more likely to uh, be susceptible to infection uh, to the virus. And it's very important that we think about the majority of health facility service staff. It's not just the doctors and nurses and, and um, health workers, it's the receptionists, the clerks, the cleaners, the catering staff. And again, there's a female predominance in that workforce and as such, they are more likely to be exposed to the virus. Um, I want to, again, draw some attention to the issues that, that are there for the health aspects of COVID. And this, unfortunately, is the death rates. And there's been lots of discussion worldwide about the difference between men and women and the COVID death rates. Now, it's important to note that several studies have shown that men and women have the same prevalence, that the infection rates for men and women are the same, but that men with COVID-19 are 2.4 times more at risk 
for worse outcomes and death compared to women. That's independent of age. And in Australia, as of the 22nd of June, um, there were 7,435 confirmed cases, 102 deaths, of which 57 were men and 45 were women. These are tragic stories, but you can see here that there is still a worse outcome for men. And some, uh, there's quite a lot of research now looking at why there's this gender difference. It seems to be that women have stronger immune systems related to the XX chromosomes and that the um, angiotensin converting enzyme 2 levels are higher in males, which is important in terms of allowing the viral particles to take hold, that men have higher smoking rates, and that's particularly true in Asian populations, and smoking is very significantly tied in with a worse outcome, well, for everything pretty much, but particularly in, in COVID as well and also that men tend to engage in riskier behaviour, particularly young men. And there are some studies in, and local studies, in fact, looking at um, risky behaviour of denying um, the possibility of becoming unwell, the so-called I'm bulletproof, um, and um, behaviours that involve flouting isolation rules and distancing and so on, and then having symptom denial. So young men um, have a lot to answer for. I want to now turn to special issues for pregnant women in the COVID-19 pandemic, again, impacting on women's mental health, a health issue. So pregnant women are not more likely to contract COVID-19, but in those women who do have COVID-19 in pregnancy, and we are very fortunate again in Australia that this is a tiny number, but in the rest of the world, this is a real issue that pregnancy can alter the immune system, which can cause more severe symptoms of COVID. There is emerging evidence of the vertical transmission. So if the mother contracts COVID, then uh, some figures have talked about a 50% likelihood that the fetus or developing baby would also contract the virus. Although the proportion of pregnancies affected and the significance of this to the neonate or new newborn is yet to be actually determined. And um, uh, the information that comes out, particularly from the UK, um, is, is critical in, in understanding this issue. So again, drawing on the UK uh, data, it's really clear that pregnant women with COVID-19 are more likely to have an increased risk of venous thromboembolism. So women, pregnant women with COVID-19 more likely to have DVTs and also then flicking off um, into pulmonary embolism and other places. And if these women are reduced in their mobility, so if they're in a, in a very tiny flat in isolation, and this is again coming back from the UK, um, that, you know, there are often many uh, situations where there is a very uh, strict isolation and very um, decreased opportunities to move around, but that increases the risk of a DVT and uh, emboli. There's also this other data that's very disturbing coming out from the UK, which is the increased risk of sudden exacerbation of COVID infection symptoms after the woman has given birth. And that's almost in the immediate post-delivery situation. So of 427 cases of COVID positive pregnant women in London or in the UK, 40 of these women needed intensive care unit immediately after they gave birth, within the first two or three hours. And, the, and such a significantly tragic um, data here that 21 uh, of those women um, died uh, in the few hours post giving birth. There were also seven baby deaths. And this is a really awful situation, uh, as, as, you would, uh, as you would agree, um, that a woman basically who has COVID positive uh, um, viral infection manages with her, her super souped up immune system, which, which happens in pregnancy, that there is a very strong, robust immune system through pregnancy. Uh, but unfortunately, shortly after giving birth, that immune system protection seems to sort of quickly disappear and she has a fulminant respiratory infection, infective um, uh, disease which is requiring ventilation and so there are, are now a, a group of um, uh, people in the UK who are setting up 
um, delivery suites in intensive care units in order to provide that much needed ventilation for the women quickly after giving birth. So what does this do to the mental health? And this is also an issue for our pregnant women here who may or may not have COVID and more likely they're not going to have COVID infection since we're very lucky to have low infection rates. But nonetheless, hearing about all this on the, on the media and it's been very pronounced media coverage, a little less now, but uh, still very pronounced media coverage, that many of our pregnant women have been extremely anxious about this. And we get questions all the time uh, in the area of women's mental health from pregnant women saying, will I get the, the virus and pass it on to my fetus? And as I say, the answer there is still emerging. Um, if my fetus gets a virus, will he or she be deformed in some way? What are the long-term effects of this? If I get COVID-19, will I die and therefore my baby? If I'm COVID positive, will I need to have a cesarean section and will my baby be isolated away from me? This is a really based on the stories of what happened in, in China particularly, where there were cesarean sections um, and isolation of baby from mother, which is so awfully difficult and terrible for um, that bonding. If I'm COVID positive and have a vaginal delivery, will the baby catch it from me? So again, that was the concern and that's why the cesarean sections were performed overseas. If I go to hospital to have my baby, will I get COVID? This was a question that came uh, you know, loud and strong from many women and the fear about if I, if I go into hospital in the early stages, uh, you know, will I have my partner with me? Will I be giving birth by myself? Will there be any doctors there for me and my baby? And then should I have a home birth? So um, there's a lot in this area. And uh, for those of us who are working with uh, potentially women who are thinking about having a child or who are pregnant, these are really critical questions that add to the anxiety in the, in the pregnant woman. And there is a high level of anxiety about the normality of their developing baby, the, the will I have a, a healthy outcome uh, following childbirth. All of those normal questions are now being exacerbated in this particular population. And we don't have all the answers um, by a long shot yet. But we do need to stand side by side with our pregnant women to actually provide that support and also provide realistic data as it comes, not the scary stuff, but to actually provide a realistic situation and answer the questions together in a collaborative effort to make sure that she is safe, her baby is safe and her mental health is as protected as we can get it. So here are some proposed solutions. And again, there are some that involve the uh, funding story, but general health measures of social distancing, isolation, especially stopping smoking um, and having uh, good mental health. So this is again for all people, but um, healthcare workers, as I started this section talking about women health and COVID, um, the provision of PPE, special care in hospitals, adequate representation and decision-making, really critical. Uh, that healthcare workers and women healthcare workers and, and specific um, roles, so uh, facility staff have representation and decision making. Pregnancy services, we really need to be careful that we're providing adequate information for pregnant women, special antenatal care and well-planned birthing um, services. Uh, ensuring capacity within the mental health system to anticipate a, an increased surge for mental health support amongst women and children and women and girls. The Medicare benefits scheme to cover telehealth consultations for mental health is really critical and to expand the support available through treatment plans as well. Now I'm going to talk a lot more about women mental health and COVID. To take us back to mental health for women um, before COVID. Um, we've been working for many years in the area of women's mental health and clearly there are many, many influences and there's, they're interrelated and interactive uh, spheres of influence, including genetic, bioneurological, psychological, social and cultural. And those things still ring very true in the impact on women's mental health. It's, a, it's a, currently, even before COVID, sorry, not currently, but before COVID, the cost of mental illness in women was enormous 
$22 billion per year in direct and of lost productivity. And this is mainly through anxiety and depression with treatment costs, lost earnings, uh, divorce costs, loss of care to elderly and cost of the loss of effective parenting of children when a woman develops a mental illness. And of course, now we have to add in to the social factors, along with all the ones there, violence, poverty, gender inequities in wage, power, social roles, the pandemic impact. There is biological impact um, and there's psychological impacts, all leading interactively to changes, to differences in the way women present with mental ill health. Isolation for women and COVID because of COVID has raised a number of issues. And the paradox of quarantine is that we use quarantine, quarantining effectively to deal with infection. That's not new, it goes back to the plague in 1377. But the paradox here is that isolation is intended to keep people safe. But for some women and children, being isolated at home is actually unsafe. And the negative consequences of this include the risk of losing jobs, economic vulnerabilities, psychological health issues resulting from isolation, loneliness and uncertainty for all. But the big one for women is the frequency and severity of family violence, including sexual violence. This has particularly increased and it has increased in Victoria um, astronomically during this pandemic. Unfortunately, during COVID-19, particularly during the isolated phase, there was a noted increase in women uh, at risk of experiencing or experiencing family violence, an increase in women experiencing extreme forms of violence and abuse, and the number of women needing emergency interventions involving the police. And so family and sexual violence has always significantly impacted women's mental health. And the particular outcomes have included anxiety, depression, panic, fears, phobias, hypervigilance, alcohol and illicit substance use, as well as suicide. And unfortunately, all of that escalated uh, during the, the COVID um, isolative or, or lockdown phase. And unfortunately, despite funding injections for family violence response services, there are still limited pathways for mental health services and safe accommodation for women. Um, and that the, these are the um, um, uh, references that uh, do actually speak to some of the uh, gender uh, themed issues in family and sex, sexual violence at this time. So we have some proposed solutions, which is about integrating preventative efforts, of course, always. And it's pleasing to see some of the advertisements that have been there basically saying the pandemic is no excuse to uh, be violent or abusive. Um, and those things are very important. But it is also important that we have um, solutions to increasing the domestic violence shelters as essential services, to designating safe spaces for women when, where they can report abuse without necessarily alerting perpetrators. I personally have been engaged with um, clients who have called me from their toilets, their bathrooms, uh, because there's been no safe space to tell me about the awful abuse and fear that they are experiencing. And um, again, there have been a number of services online that we've been able to access and some safe accommodation, but it is, is really a problem that is escalating. So we do need to have more uh, advocacy and awareness as well as injecting funding into this whole area. I'm not going to go through all of this, but I think the Domestic Violence Resources uh, Centre Victoria put out some excellent practical help. And again, um, since this will be online, I'll leave you to think about this where it might apply for any patients or clients you're, you're working with, for any friends or colleagues or women that you know might be struggling with the issue. So now I, I want to touch a bit more on women, COVID and anxiety and depression. Now, before I launch into the data from a survey conducted by my uh, good friend and colleague, the Deputy Director of MAPRC, Associate Professor Caroline Gervich, um, we need to understand that women before COVID had a four times um, increase in anxiety disorders compared to men and a twofold increase in depressive disorders compared to men. So that's the already elevated 
numbers of women experiencing mental ill health. And um, Caroline and, and uh, colleagues, we've, we conducted the survey and um, the results of the survey, which was uh, conducted, this is the first wave of data that came back between 3rd April and 3rd May. So that's when the data was collected, right at the height of isolation, that we um, had responses from 1,495 adults, both in metropolitan uh, Melbourne and in rural Victoria. And from that, um, the data shows that 39% of females have moderate to severe levels of psychological distress compared to 31% of males. 35% of females have moderate to, le to severe levels of depression compared to 19% of males. 27% of females have more stress compared to 10% of males. And 21% of females had moderate to severe levels of anxiety compared to 9% of females. So again, you can see that from these data um, in this sample, there was certainly a predominance of mental ill health for women. The highest rates of suicidal thoughts were amongst young women aged 18 to 24, with 37% of women in that age group reporting suicidal thoughts. And that's compared to 17% of young men, or sorry, 17% of men. It's, it's reflected in presentations to mental health services and services in Victoria have reported a significant increase in women with mental health issues. The online survey also uh, uncovered that in fact 29% of males and 39% of females said that they already had a diagnosis of a mental illness before um, they talked about the COVID impact. And of course, there are special issues that I probably don't have um, time to go into, but special issues that face particular women's groups. So mental health care is, is, is a group that um, is predominantly women who are providing um, care for um, sick relatives, whether that's relatives with, with physical ill health conditions or with mental ill health conditions. But during the pandemic, um, the mental health carers have described through various mental health caring, uh, carer associations, so Tandem, for example, Victoria is, is, a, is a big one, um, that they have experienced increased problems themselves in their mental health because of a lack of respite of availability or a lack of support when you're in lockdown. Already that role is a difficult one. It's done lovingly because it's providing care and support to a relative, but um, there are some incredible mental health uh, costs to that to the actual carer. Migrant and refugee women have faced um, different uh, issues that have in fact worsened their mental health with the language barrier being heightened during lockdown and, uh, and being isolated from cultural community groups at that time also led to an increased uh, problem in terms of anxiety and depression, particularly for women, uh, and uh, sometimes a general sense of anxiety being inflamed by not really having the access to information in a way that was um, uh, able to be understood by um, some migrant refugee women. Older women, and this is another important area, uh, older women in our community have described an, a very significant increased level of mental health stress and anxiety and depression because of their increased risk of actually contracting the infection. And in fact, conversations with some clients over the age of 65 um, in fact, people with, over the age of 70 were given the alarming statistics, which are true, about the increased risk of infection. And so people said that this led to them feeling like that it was just a matter of time before they became sick and, and then could possibly die. So that's a really incredibly um, stressful set, set of events for many older people in our population, and particularly older women, to contend with older men also. Isolation for older women from extended family support was also another factor that the lockdown um, enhanced and, and women talked about the strength and, and courage that they uh, had always gained from 
giving and providing support to extended family members and in particular the difficulties of um, older women having roles to uh, help out with grandchildren uh, which suddenly ceased was a real issue for many in our community. Then of course we have the issues for women with pre-existing mental ill health conditions and I've already talked about the fact that women already have higher rates of mental ill health and following the pandemic or during the pandemic and isolation there's been a worsening of depression, anxiety, borderline personality disorder which is not a term I favour because I think that it's got a big element of PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder in that condition and that has worsened in terms of outcomes and behaviours as well as obviously the obsessive compulsive disorders for women where um, with the increased focus on washing your hands, hand sanitizing, um, germ phobia, which is part of an OCD condition, this is all exacerbated during this particular time. And eating disorders, which again is a very predominant condition experienced by women, we've seen an increase in eating disorder uh, disorders. So thinking about the current national pandemic response plan, and I'm just going to put some bits to you, the current national plan recognises a link between family violence and women's mental health. However, the plan states that men, not women, are recognised as a vulnerable group, despite clear evidence of poorer mental health during outcomes among women, both during the pandemic and in general. The plan does not have any recognition of gendered social and economic inequalities that drive the violence against women and that also directly drive poor mental health outcomes in women and girls. And the plan does not address the mental health needs of carers. That's our current pandemic response plan. Yep, I would agree with this particular image that we need to do better. And You'll be pleased to hear that there is advocacy underway, but uh, particular uh, kudos to the Victorian Women's Mental Health Alliance, uh, which is part of the Women's Health Victoria. This is a fantastic group that are working very hard and represent a broad number of uh, groups in our community in Victoria that provide um, services, advocacy, um, and an understanding of issues that impact on women's mental health. I'm very proud to be a, a member of that executive and um, this group working alongside many others is trying to advocate for a better understanding of the specific issues that face women in their mental health outcomes during this particular COVID time. There's also many women with lived experience and carers who um, are, are being uh, extremely energetic in the advocacy space as they should be and hats off to women who've had who have lived experience of mental ill health and yet are able to be so strong when the situation can be so so difficult. I'm also delighted that the federal government has appointed a deputy chief medical officer Dr Ruth Vine as a chief psychiatrist um, who's also looking at these issues. There are numerous academics and clinicians who are also working on the issues for women uh, and mental health at this particular time. But like the old uh, army recruitment uh, sign, we need you, we need all of you to help us with the advocacy to ensure that in this, in this particularly critical time of the pandemic and other times, that women's mental health is able to be supported because as a community we need more women's mental health research we need advocacy personalized services and more training in the recognition of women's mental health as a specific issue with separate and important impacts and presentations of mental ill health and this is important for all of us right now but also important for future generations because women's mental health is always everyone's business and we need to all understand the causes of mental ill health in women, tailor treatments and services to improve women's mental health and thereby help our whole community. I'm very proud to um, 
stand here today with a whole body of research work being conducted over many decades and uh, being conducted at the Monash Alfred Psychiatry Research Centre with my incredibly hard working group of colleagues and very talented researchers. We have a number of really um, in, enlightened sponsors who have helped us along the way to our research goals to help women. And I really want to give a big thank you to many, many sponsors over the years who've understood this need to support women's mental health research and provided us with um, meaningful support to conduct the work that we do. The Felton Bequest and their understanding of perimenopausal depression, equity trustees also working in the area of women's mental health with us. The Helen McPherson Smith Trust who have provided us uh, funding to provide a service for rural women who experience mental ill health and we provide a clinical service there. The Walensky Foundation who have provided funding to help us look at borderline personality disorder in a completely different way and provide a new treatment option there. The Debbie Gaunt Foundation um, again providing us help to look at a new treatment strategy for menopausal depression. The Stanley Medical Research Institute Washington, the NHMRC, Alfred Health, Monash University, Victorian Department of uh, health and human services and many many more along the way but again um, I do want to make it clear that in thinking about women's mental health this is not something that is just for us it is for all of us and it is for our future generations that we need to train up our next generations and help people who are treating women in understanding how to personalize this service so I'm very proud to actually now introduce to you the Monash Alfred Psychiatry Research Centre course, short course on women's mental health. We target this course for any clinician, student or interested individual. And in this course, we do adopt a biopsychosocial aspect of the cause and management of mental ill health in women. It is uh, a, an integrated number of impacts and um, learnings that we hope people will be able to get from doing this short course and I'm very proud to um, with this launch this particular course and show you a small video that Dr. Sarah Rothstein has put together. so many different aspects of the situation. I think um, for myself, and I'm sure for all the participants, when we thought about women's mental health and COVID, we probably weren't thinking quite as broad as what your presentation has provided. So thank you for, for highlighting all those different elements to this, to this very important conversation that we all need to be having. Um, 
I'm just having a look at the Q&A section and we don't really seem to have any questions um, that have been posed. So we, we do have um, almost 15 minutes. So if anybody would like to put a question forward, uh, please do. Uh, the one question that we have had um, is, will the slides be available after the presentation? Um, and I see you're nodding. So yes, so we will um, we will send those through. We'll also be sending through a post uh, presentation survey, um, which will just be very very short, just to get a little bit of feedback and, and a bit more of an understanding of who um, who's logged in. Um, yes, it's very tricky when we can't actually see you all, um, but uh, would be great to get some feedback. Um, so, is there any any questions that anyone would like to put through? We have had about a hundred people tuned in, um, which has been fantastic. So thank you, everybody. Oh, there's a question about uh, perimenopausal depression. And, uh, yes, uh, and we also have another question that's just popped up now. Uh, oh, we've got a few now. Okay, so the first question that's very easy for me to answer is, does the adolescent short course cover issues only for girls? Um, the answer to that is mostly. Um, so the adolescent module, um, do log in and have a look at the topics that are discussed. It is targeted specifically around um, adolescent, um, adolescent girls, but also um, there's a section on family violence and child abuse. Um, but however, there are a few sections that have information that's applicable across the lifespan a little bit as well, including the um, premenstrual dysphoric disorder section, um, the complex trauma disorder section, or otherwise known as uh, borderline personality disorder, and also the section on uh, hormonal contraceptives and mental health. Um, oh, and also, sorry, the section on um, polycystic ovarian syndrome, which um, would be applicable to a, to a broader range of women than just the, um, the adolescent age group um, but yes this module is just targeted towards adolescents we will be launching our module looking at midlife um, and particularly the time of perimenopause um, towards uh, in, in the next sort of two to three months so it should be end of august um, early september when that one will be launched um, we also have the pregnancy um, module that will be launched um, subsequent to that and then there will be an older age uh, module as well so we will uh, keep everyone updated as to when those are launching and there may even be some more free open webinars to celebrate those launches but we will see I don't want to dob Jay into anything um, so that was one question um, there was uh, so the next question that was asked was um, is there any data about the specific impact on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women regarding COVID um, so we also have had another question specifically around borderline personality disorder, um, but maybe we'll start with that one, Jack Tree. Yeah, so um, I have to say that at that point, we have not gotten any particular data about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women. I am in contact with some of the um, particular um, epidemiology and other researchers uh, working on, this, on the, the data, and uh, I haven't got anything to add about that at the moment. So um, it's a very important area, clearly. Um, in, in other ways, you know, um, I think we, we uh, take our hats off to the Northern Territory and, the, and Western Australia in that the, um, the numbers of people with COVID there are, are very small. Um, but again, you would have to worry about the uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population. So sorry, no data yet, but we'll keep an eye on that. The new approach to, be, to borderline personality disorder, I could, uh, have we got five hours? But um, it's, it's really important that um, we think about how borderline personality disorder has actually come about. And in particular in women, there, is many, many, there are many, many times when the actual uh, whole syndrome is related to very early life trauma. And I use the word trauma in, in a very broad spectrum. So it includes emotional neglect, emotional abuse, physical abuse, and sexual abuse. And um, when we take the retrospective stories from our women who have been diagnosed as BPD, you find that in fact there's quite a high level of awfulness and difficulties and challenges in early life, which often the women have risen to with incredible valour. But nonetheless, um, I'm very keen to focus on the treatment options for people with this condition by thinking about it in a trauma 
informed way and also the brain biology in a trauma informed way leads us to different um, options so for example at the moment we're running a clinical trial called the allison project and um, that is a trial looking at an nmda receptor modulator which um, is a different approach to particularly um, people with diagnosed and it's for both men and women diagnosed with bpd i really don't like the disorder uh, the personality disorder part of that I don't like borderline either so I don't like any of that um, particular diagnostic terminology because my personal belief is I think we should be giving women a medal who have come through what they've come through uh, rather than saying that they've got disordered personalities so I like the ICD-11 um, classification system from this perspective because there's a diagnosis called little c which stands for complex PTSD and that describes um, a number of the symptoms that, that the women and others experience. We have a lot of questions about the short yes. course. Fabulous. We do, thank you. Um, so uh, just to go through them. Um, so what level of education is required to do the course? Well, the course is um, aimed at uh, what well, was specifically designed with general practitioners in mind. However, um, we really do welcome anyone um, who, who has an interest in this area, um, especially from uh, medical um, people um, from any allied health discipline. Um, but even you, there are sections, um, you, anyone really, we, we, have, we haven't, we haven't um, you know, use too much medical jargon, I don't think, um, and we've tried to keep everything as, as um, you know, clear. So really we welcome anyone um, and we'd be really keen to hear um, responses or, or any feedback from anybody. Um, is there accreditation for completing the course? Um, we are in the process of trying to jump through the specific hoops that are required to do that. Um, and we are waiting to hear back from the College of Psychiatrists, the College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists um, in Australia. And um, I think we have almost officially got approval for points from the Australian Psychological Society. But if there are any other organisations that people um, would... <laughs> what was that? Sorry. Oh, and the College of GPs, um, we, we, will, um, we will also be uh, going through that process too. So, the, so there will be, um, but we, there's, there's, we wanted to get this out there without needing to wait for the particular hoops to be jumped through, which is a little bit slowed down, I think, at this time as well. Um, there's a question here about evidence around worsening of the metabolic syndrome and COVID-19. Um, and um, there was also... I'll take that uh, one. Maybe you could talk about the cost for the short course. Yep. Um, so the cost for the short course, it is, um, it is... Actually, Tiffany, would you like to, to mention what the costs are? Certainly, Sarah. The costs are 99 for students and 199 for full paying adults. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll go back to some of the, um, the clinical questions. Uh, metabolic syndrome and COVID-19. So um, it depends on whether we're talking about the actual virus causing metabolic syndrome. No, it doesn't. But isolation we're seeing, and I actually had a slide which I took out because it was a bit too frivolous, of people gaining weight and people um, eating a lot more during this particular time. So um, that of course doesn't help with the uh, obesity problem that, that many people are struggling with. And so there, there is going to be that consequence down the track. So again, when I talk about eating disorders, we can talk about worsening of that in either direction. So with the anorexia type eating disorders, but also the overeating disorders, and then just um, the, the sort of response to anxiety to take some comfort eating in there. The um, MIA, so maternal immune activation, does it occur in pregnant women who test positive for COVID-19? So it's an interesting um, area that I think we need, to need, we need to think a lot more about and I'm waiting for the further data from the um, obstetrics, obstetricians college in uh, London. They've got the biggest collected database and I have access to that. So one of the big things that they're looking at is um, well, they are very carefully monitoring what happens to the 
people who test positive during a pregnancy and then following through their whole other markers for their immune system. But certainly, you, um, you know, they've seen this absolute extrapolation of the immune response post delivery. So stay tuned for that one. Um, people with chronic trauma presenting in more distress postnatal. And so it's, again, I have a comment from Dr. Kathy Sloan or question from Dr. Kathy Sloan, who is a general practitioner. And um, she agrees with what we're saying that in fact, a number of women who have underlying conditions are actually also um, uh, seeing that worsen. So yes, mums without their mums, uh, particularly first time mums um, who will often rely on their own mothers to help them. Uh, it's a really difficult series uh, uh, situation. One colleague saw three marriage breakups in one afternoon. Yes, again, that is another um, uh, fallout from uh, spending a, a enforced time in a difficult relationship. It will either make or break some relationships. Um, reports from ED. Now, very interesting. The e emergency departments by and large during the height of the isolative period went into quiet mode because there was a fear that people would catch the virus by coming into hospitals plus um, also I guess the message became you know about stay at home so EDs didn't see a whole bunch of women's presentations then but now is, is uh, uh, recently um, there's been an increase in the numbers of people presenting to emergency departments. But I think we've got a, more people presenting in the community to their primary healthcare practitioners, as well as community services in general, and more presentations clearly to things such as Lifeline. Uh, 1-800-RESPECT, for example, is, is another important community service that have been um, flooded and so many other uh, so similar services. So I, I do think that um, it, it is an important area that we can keep an eye on what's going on with women who have pre-existing mental ill health because the chances are that they're worsening. Now I have another question from a practitioner who feels mental health is over medicated by the medical community. Is your course for me? Yes, as I said, we take a biopsychosocial approach. Um, the film clip showed a lot more bio, but um, there are many, many other aspects to it. So certainly we, we, we are very strong believers in the biopsychosocial um, integrated holistic care for women who have mental ill health problems. Um, do you think that the number of appointments under Medicare mental health care plan will be increased this year due to COVID-19 anxieties? Um, look, it is really important that uh, whichever way people can keep going with their, um, their mental health, that, you know, I'd certainly advocate for that. But, um, you know, government's going to, is, is already being inundated with requests for funding, this funding, that and so on. Um, but I think we just have to keep pushing that I do think there's a cause, there is a real reason to expand that mental health care plan, a uh, number of appointments with psychologists and others that would be covered, but it's, uh, it's, it's anyone's guess what would happen there. So um, this is why with the advocacy is really critical. I would encourage and urge people to please keep in mind that there is a whole aspect of gender impact here that is not currently hitting the high notes in terms of um, really being top of mind for um, the policy makers uh, in our country. And I think that would be really important to keep it at the top of their mind or put it at the top of their mind if it's not already there. I think we've run out of time, Sarah. We have, we're right on 1.30. I just wanted to thank the, the um, person who, oh, it seems to have disappeared from my list, who was talking about um, a specific uh, Monash researcher in regards to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander question. So thank you for that. Um, I was typing an answer, but it seems to have disappeared. Um, and yes, so I just want to thank everyone. Um, just in, also just to add to that question about um, the, the course being for you, if, if, if you see um, a lot of people being over-medicated. Um, I have previously worked in the clinic with Jayshree and we would have agreed that we saw a lot of women who were over-medicated being 
over medicated and particularly women with complex trauma that is a big problem um, so certainly this course does um, does advocate for you know making sure you know what it is you're targeting and, and choosing things judiciously but also remembering the the psychosocial really important elements of treatment as well so thank you everyone i'd just like to thank everyone thank you to professor kulkani and, and thank you to tiffany who i forgot to introduce at the beginning i'm so sorry um who has been very much involved at the back end of this event but also the short course so we couldn't have done it without you so thank you so much and thank you everyone it's been wonderful um we will be making the slides available we'll, we'll send around a survey um, in the coming days so please look out for that and we look forward to seeing you online with the short course so thank you so much